Hello and welcome in to the Fog.net podcast. My name is Michael Swain, the Kansas beat writer for 24-7 Sports, and we're really excited about the episode we have coming your way today. We are joined by Jeremy Clark of HornFrogBlitz.com, the 24-7 Sports TCU website. We'll chat all things TCU and Kansas coming up this weekend. The highly anticipated game. College game day will be there, 11 a.m. kick. It's uh, shaping up to be a, a big Saturday in Lawrence, but for you, Jeremy, uh, we're recording this Wednesday afternoon. Uh, how's the start of your week been so far down there in Texas? I mean, it, it's it's been great, Michael. And this, I mean, we we predicted this, right? I mean, we all knew this was coming. We all knew that there was going to be two undefeated teams. And while Texas and Oklahoma are playing in the Cotton Bowl, you know, we all predicted game day would be in Lawrence, right? Of course, yeah. I remember when you know when Jimbo Fisher sitting up there, you know, talking about Nick Saban and everything. You know, that's this weekend too. But no, yeah, all, all eyes will be on Lawrence at least between eight a.m. and eleven a.m. Central Time, and then we'll see what the the TV ratings are like for the game after that. But I want to start here because you mentioned that. Like, what is the vibe like? You know, around Fort Worth right now because I don't know if did TCU fans expect to start the season like this? What were like the expectations going into the year and, and what's just the feeling like around campus? I mean, there's a lot of excitement right now with the fan base. I mean, I, I think everyone kind of felt like they could start the year three, and zero, um, starting off the year with Colorado, Tarleton and SMU. Mm-hmm. I think there was a pretty good feeling they'd go through that slate undefeated, but Oklahoma was a big question mark just simply because, Oklahoma has dominated the series. TCU hasn't won against them since 2014. Then they go out there and they not only win, they crush them. I mean, you're talking about a team that was getting a little bit of little bit of uh, respect um, in the Big 12, but not really nationally. And they were part of that other receiving vote category in the AP poll. Then all of a sudden, you get a nationally televised game and you're playing against Oklahoma and everyone – felt like Oklahoma was a really strong program. You go out and win by 31 points. And, I mean, there is a lot of excitement around the program right now. And, and, and I think if you if you ask the fans, they would have been very happy with 3-1. and one, But to be sitting at 4-0 and oh right now and ranked number 17 in the nation, you have the number two offense. That's what, that you, what you brought Dox in for. You brought Sonny Dox in because you wanted to revamp this offense. You wanted to make that identity – for TCU to be known as an offensive school. And right now they're ranked number two in total offense, ranked number two in points per game. So they're doing something right. And I think they're very excited about this Saturday. Definitely. And so I want to talk about the transition from Gary Patterson to Sonny Dykes because, you know, Gary's obviously a staple there at TCU for so long. How much has changed? Because I go back to last year, you look at the game between KU and TCU, right? A one score game. But obviously, it's a situation where it's an interim head coach. There's questions about what's going to happen after the season. I guess, like, how much has changed between the coaching change and the transfer portal? Like, how different is this team than it was last year? Everything. I mean, everything has changed. I've been I've been covering the team for 17 years, and me and Gary Patterson got along great. I mean, we we had a great relationship, but. I mean, I have fans at some point knowing that maybe it was time for TCU and Gary Patterson to part ways. There just seemed to be a trend that was happening in the last the last four years. But I've, I've said this a hundred times and I'll still say it, but it almost appeared like Sonny Docks was handed a piece of paper when he first got hired. And in the left column, it said everything that Coach Patterson did not do and fans did not like. And Sonny Docks is doing the complete opposite. You're talking about media access, media access to open practices. Um, we're out there every day through spring camp. They had open practices during fall camp. We're talking to any players that we want to. If, if they want to talk, we're allowed to talk to them, whether it's a redshirt senior or a true freshman. We're talking to those We're talking to those players. If we want to talk to a coach, in the past, maybe we talked to an assistant coach. Now, if we want to talk to a position coach, we're talking to a position coach. If we want to talk to a GA, if it's a worthy interview, they're going to let us talk to a GA. So things things in that nature have have been really great for media. The fans are digging it. The fans love it. The, the fans, they love content. We're able to provide that content for them. Uh, the social media platform for TCU, they've hit a home run with that group. They're mm. a tremendous, tremendously talented group of people that, that run their social media and create all their hot videos and everything they do in between. So – that that part of it was all great, but at the end of the day, fans wanted to see, okay, 
can he win games for us? Can he can he do what we want him to do, which is turn this thing around? We're tired of going five and seven. We're tired of being in the bottom half of the Big 12. And so far through the first four games, you're starting to see that. You're starting to see not only is he bringing a great vibe to the program, something that was missing. I was told one day it's one thing to be a bad program and to close things. It just makes everything worse. And for them to be a bad program and start to open things, that starts to get fans more excited. And now when you're seeing the wins, obviously it's a lot of excitement. So a big, yeah. big time transition. He's, he's at a home run so far. That's so, so many things you mentioned there, I think are things that maybe KU fans can relate to where I think you go to the Les Miles era and there's no assistant coaches. There's barely any players. It's just less talking. Mm-hmm. And that gets kind of stale. And it's very like that with Lance. You know, I just got back from being with the coordinators. You get to ask them questions and they're pretty straightforward with stuff, you know. And I think that that's refreshing. And it seems like it's refreshing there, too. I want to talk about the offense because it seems like that's been the, the part of TCU that I think has really generated some excitement. At least for me, when I turn on a TCU game, I'm like, oh, this offense is going to be fun. They're going to make plays. I guess what kind of offense is it for folks that maybe haven't had the chance to watch TCU so far this year? Well, it's identified as an air raid, but that doesn't mean they're going to go out and throw the football 55 times a game. They're going to want to utilize the passing game to set up the run game. And it's worked out perfectly. They've been able to balance each one of those phases of the game um, through the first four weeks of the season. I think one, one week against Colorado, you weren't really throwing the ball well, but you ran for over 300 yards. The next week against Tarleton, you rushed for less than 200, but you threw for over 400. And so it was really – we were all waiting to see what kind of – bound. when are they going to put it together? When are they going to put the run game and the pass game together? We saw it start to happen against SMU last week, but against Oklahoma, it just all came together. There wasn't anything – we were up in the press box, and I looked over at one point and just looked at the other guys and said – there's nothing Oklahoma can do to stop this offense. They are doing whatever they want to do against a pretty good coach team. Brent Venables has never had it. I mean, it's been a long time. I, I mean, we had to go back, I think, all the way to 05 since Brent Venables has given up that many points to a football team, to an offense. So that, that in particular has just been very impressive. But they it, it, it's, it's an air raid offense, Michael, but – let me tell you, they're going to run the football. Mm. They want to run the football. They've got a great offensive line. They've got really good running backs and Kendra Miller and Amari DiMercato. And Imani Bailey is another guy, third down back. I mean, he's he's a really good, flashy, explosive player. But I think everything's been working this year, and you're probably going to ask me about them because I get asked about them all the time. It, I think it's really been working based off the success of Max Duggan right now. Yeah, well, that was my next question. Well, what's the quarterback – situation been like like take me back to camp and I guess walk me through kind of the first few weeks of the season because I remember hearing like okay Chandler Morris might be the, the guy and now all of a sudden here we are Max Duggan's out running defensive backs against Oklahoma yeah I mean it's it was a crazy thing because the great access that we had through fall camp we got to watch some of these things transpire we were watching Max Duggan Chandler Morris go back and forth there were some days that Chandler would look better. Some days with Max would look better. But it was such a close competition, you really couldn't decide who was going to win the job. And we were really relying on internal sources or what Sonny Docks would tell us during press conferences. And he wasn't tipping his hand. We really, truly didn't know um, who was going to be the starter until about a week before Colorado. Now, they didn't come out publicly and say who it was going to be. We just knew by developing those sources that, hey, this guy's getting more reps with the first team than the other guy. And so we had an idea, but the thing about Max, even though he didn't get the job, he was – and and people have probably seen this. Sonny Docks got pretty emotional after that SMU win, just talking about Max Duggan because he talked hmm. about how Max was resilient. He, de- he never pouted in this day and age where a player doesn't get their way. They're going to hit the transfer portal, and hmm. especially a quarterback. So – Max kind of rose above all that. He just stayed patient. And it's it, it's a hard pill to swallow. I mean, you're you're a guy that has started 29 games and all of a sudden you're a backup. So he said there's not a lot of people that can go out there and do that and, and respond the way he has. And, I, and I'll tell you, Max had very high expectations coming into TCU. 
He was a four star. He's a guy that chose TCU over Notre Dame, chose chose him over Ohio State, Minnesota. I mean, he had some really big programs looking at him, visited TCU once, fell in love with the place and TCU's the place he wanted to be. And I'll be honest, there's been times in Max's career where I'm like, man, this kid is a really, really good quarterback. And then there's been other times where I'm scratching my head saying, how in the world is he TCU's quarterback? Mm-hmm. He he just never seemed to put it all together. But I'll, I'll say right now that he's throwing at a better rate than I've ever seen him throw. He's ranked number one in the nation in efficiency, passing efficiency. I think last time I checked, he was third in completion percentage. And these aren't – I mean, they, they do the snap routes. They do the quick screens, do stuff like that. But what I really like about him right now is his ability to throw the ball downfield. He's got better touch on his passes. His ball placement's better than any any point of his career. Uh, his decision making. I mean, he took five sack, sacks against SMU, and a lot of people were complaining he's got to step in the pocket. He's got to step up and avoid that. And Sonny Docks came out and said, "Listen, he's doing that probably because the coverage was so great, and he didn't want to turn over the ball. The max of the past three seasons would have thrown that ball instead of getting sacked. He would have thrown into a crowd of three defenders and." He would, have, he would have had a turnover. So yeah. that's the thing with Max, just decision-making, his ability. We always knew he was fast. I, I, I told a bunch of Oklahoma radio stations last week, if y'all think Adrian Martinez is fast, wait till you see Max Duggan run. And Max Duggan is fast. He's probably one of the top five or six fastest kids on TCU's roster. So wow. uh, I, I'm really happy for him. He's just a – he's a really great person. Um, a real, and, and any of those TCU players, they love all the quarterbacks. But I just think – there's a certain place, and they'll never come out here and, and admit it publicly. But I really think that they feel like that guy is such a leader that they're gonna they're gonna do anything they can to help mm-hmm. him get the win. Definitely, and, and to run through the stats real quick because I mean they are next level. Like you look at the just the numbers, right? You know, eleven touchdowns, zero interceptions, almost a thousand yards passing, seventy five percent completion, ten point six yards per attempt, like. For as good as Jalen Daniels has been this year for KU, really up until the Iowa State game, like that is equally as good. And you could argue, you know, he, he played really well against Oklahoma's you know, driving force behind that offense. But I'm curious with the wide receiver position. We've seen TCU have really good wide receivers, I, I think, in, in years past. This room, what do you feel like the strengths are and, and where do you feel like they really put pressure on the defense? Uh before I talk about the receivers, r- real quick, though, Max has only played three games, too. He only played sparingly against Colorado. That's a very stats, good point. Yeah, stats are even better when you think he only played late against Colorado. But the receivers, Michael, I'll tell you right now, it's it, it's a very, very talented group. I don't I don't like to compare them to uh, years past, but but I, I'll say this is definitely one of the top three units I've, I've been around wow. since I've been covering the team. Um, you talk about size, they've got it. They've got – Quentin Johnston at 6'4". Savion Williams is 6'5". They've got guys that can run. Darius Davis, All, all everyone has seen how fast he is if you're a college football fan. Tay Barber is another speed demon. And, and Gunnar Henderson, Gunnar Henderson had a big touchdown last week against OU. And Gunnar is one of those kids that not a lot of people talk about, but if you're a TCU fan, you know all about him because he had such a great spring camp and great fall camp, and the coaches were all over him, ended up getting a scholarship. He's a guy that just makes plays. But collectively, that group just has the size. They have athleticism. They have experience. And they have speed. And I think that's what makes this offense go. And not to mention, you have those guys at receiver. But then you have a guy like uh, Jared Wiley at tight end, Jerquarius Spivey that can split out from tight end to H. Both those guys, Jared Wiley, 6'7". Jerquarius is 6'6". So, and both of them are very, very athletic. So you've got a lot of weapons to choose from in that offense. And I think that's, what's really made Max's job a lot easier. Hmm. Well, let's switch to defense because uh, so I've seen TCUs running some of the kind of the three down front that you've seen kind of Kansas state, Iowa state um, use. Is it similar to what you've seen? Obviously been around the big 12. So you've, you've seen Iowa state's kind of three man mm-hmm. front. Is it similar to that? Is it their own spin? I guess just in terms of like the structure of it, that was something I feel like gave Katie some fits last game was Iowa state used the three man, to eat up KU's five blockers, and then they had their three just Mike linebackers basically filling every gap. Right. Is it similar to what Iowa State's doing? Is it different? Like, kind of walk us through the – It's it's very it's very similar. Um, and that's 
You know, when I first talked to Joe Gillespie, at Iowa State's the first defense he mentioned. I think you're going to start seeing a lot of defenses going toward that three-man front because I've asked a lot of offensive linemen, what's easier to block? Is it a four-man front or three-man? And they, without hesitation, always say four-man front. Mm. The three-man front, for whatever reason, it's it's got so many uh, different things you can use, um, whether you're, you're rushing three or you're rushing five, rushing six. There's just so many different angles they have to prepare for, but – TCU's, uh, I, I would say the one big difference with Iowa State that we know and that we've seen in the past, they don't have a strong uh, presence of getting to the quarterback from their defensive end position. Mm -hmm. They have more sacks from the interior with uh, Dominic Williams, the true freshman, and Tymon Mitchell. Tymon Mitchell has two sacks. He's had a sack in each of the last two games. So they're, they're going to get more pressure in the middle. Um, Dylan Horton's a very athletic defensive end. And Terrell Cooper is a guy that moved out to end from the interior. He's a big, you know, 6'3", 275-pound kid. So they're going it, to – it's going to be very different from what people have seen from TCU in the past. You see you normally a 6'3", 240-pound defensive end that could just run. And mm -hmm. that's not really the case now. They're, they're utilizing their linebackers to really go out and make plays. Johnny Hodges, the transfer from uh, Navy, he's made a lot of plays. D. Winters is a guy that – didn't have a really good 2021 season. He had came into the season with very high expectations, very high expectations, and he just he didn't he didn't play up to him. He didn't live up to him, and he'll be the first one to admit it. And so right now, this defense has allowed him to fly around more. Uh, the linebackers are making a lot of plays between him and Johnny Hodges, uh, Jamoy Hodge. That Jamoy is everyone's going to remember him because he's the one that hit Dylan Gabriel last week. Mm. Jamoy is one of the Nicest kid you'll ever meet. Felt terrible about – it's one thing Sonny Knox said after that game. It's one of the first things he said, Jamoy feels terrible um, for the hit on Dylan, wants to make sure he's okay. But he is another very athletic guy right down the road from you guys from Independence, Kansas uh, Community College. So, he's he's uh, he was rated as the number one linebacker in the nation a couple years ago out of Indy. So, he uh, he's making some plays, but – Marcel Brooks is another athletic guy, but I, I think the, the thing that's going to help TCU is their speed. They're, they're still fast. Everyone knows they, they kind of made their hay with speed in the past, and that is what they have. Every, everyone I've talked to, from Colorado to, to SMU to Oklahoma, friends, fellow media members, they all say the same thing. Man, I did not know TCU was that fast. They are so fast on defense, and they're having fun. And it's – it's crazy because, and, and you guys can relate up there, uh, with that with that coaching change. I'm sure those players are having a lot of fun. They like they they like going to practice. They like doing things, and it's amazing how much just having fun can lead to wins. Mm. And we're seeing it on the defensive side of the ball, especially for TCU. Joe Gillespie is a very likable coach. He is very down to earth. We, we down here in Texas, we say a salt of the earth guy i mean he is just that guy he's 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 a a guy that players relate to he doesn't yell doesn't cuss at them just coaches defense and he coaches them hard but he coach he, he coaches coaches uh them to make plays and and i think that's the bit been the biggest reason for their success and i think right now they're allowing something around 100 yards less per game this year under gillespie than what they did last year hmm. That's huge and i love that you mentioned the team speed part of it because asking around that's what it sounds like is you know, a, a kind of a, a concern, right? You're going against a team. You played Iowa State last week. They're much more physical. But now this week, all of a sudden, kind of the athletes are kind of coming into play in addition to that defense. How do they use that team speed? Is it Are they going to blitz a lot? Is it a lot of, hey, we're going to play off and then use it to close the ball? I guess, how do you see that speed kind of show up, I guess, on defense? Well, I mean, it's they're going to have to do something to watch Jalen. I mean, Jalen's going to be the first – true quarterback they face. They Mordecai runs a little bit. Dylan Gabriel can run a little bit, but they haven't faced a true dual threat like like Jalen Daniels. So I don't know if they're going to want to blitz as much or spy him. We really haven't been told. And then even if we ask, they're not going to tell us anyway. Um, but the, the thing about it is I, I think where TCU is so fast is uh, plugging the gaps. and The defensive line has really – been the big push of how good the defense is mm. the, the way they get their push up front and their stat line is not going to be really high. They're not going to have a lot of tackles, but 
they close the gaps and they allow those linebackers to make plays. So I think that the biggest thing for them is not necessarily getting pressure on Jalen, but just playing your assignment, playing at home. And um, I know they got some really good running backs, Kansas does, and good receivers. So it's 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 going to be a it's going to be a challenge. I mean, TCU they're not perfect by any means. I'm, they're better on defense, but this is also a defense that gave up 372 passing yards to SMU. This is also a defense that gave up a 78 yard completion last week to OU. So they're susceptible to giving up big plays. It's just this defense, and it sounds like the corniest coaching cliche, they play the bend, don't break defense. And and that, it, it really is. I mean, you're going to watch them, and you're going to see them give up big plays be, between the 20s. There's mm-hmm. going to be times where you're feeling Kansas is going to go down and score easily. But somewhere around the, the 25 or the 15, TCU's defense starts to stiffen up a little bit, and that's that's really helped them this year. So I think that's that's going to kind of be their game plan going into Kansas and try to limit Jalen as much as they can. Yeah, I, KU probably faces a similar challenge there. I think they the coaching staff probably say the same thing. They're trying to do bend, don't break. Their kind of thing is let's not limit – or let's limit big plays and not let the big gains happen and force teams to kind of – you know, nickel and dime them and go four yards of carry or, you know, mm-hmm. five yards of pass attempt. Um, I'm fascinated by that of kind of who wins out in the red zone. I, for you, uh, we'll wrap up with this, I guess. When you look at this game, is there a specific stat or a key that you're looking for for either, you know, TCU is going to win or lose based on that number? I really – I'm looking at the completions downfield. Um, mm-hmm. I know they're going to get their short completions, but I want to see how well – Max continues to throw downfield. If they they've done a good job of converting third down conversions, even even the ones that are third and six or longer, they he's done a pretty good job of throwing the football. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's going to be the biggest stat. If 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 they can play in front of the sticks, and what I mean by by that is just keeping the the third downs to third and threes, third and twos, just keeping it short. I think that's going to be big for them too. But if Max, I think Max has really got to go out and complete at least sixty percent of his passes. Um, and obviously not turn the ball over. I mean, that, I mean, it's coaching one on one, one on one, you know, don't, don't turn the ball over, run the ball. Um, but I, I really do think, I feel like the offensive line is playing about as good as they can right now. They did really exceptional, especially with the different stunts that they saw last week from Venables. I know Kansas is going to do some things to, to try to trick them, but I, I feel like if they, if, if, the lanes are there. They're going to get some rushing yards. I feel like they're going to have success running the ball, but I think it's going to come down to where if if they do force Max to beat them, is he truly is he truly a different quarterback, or is this the same quarterback from last year that is just playing really good football right now? Can we do something that will stymie him and turn him back into the quarterback that he's been the last three years? I think that's going to be the biggest thing. But uh, if Max if Max can throw the ball downfield, complete those passes. And I'm not saying 40-yard bombs. I'm talking about the the 10 to 15-yard variety. Complete those passes. I think TCU has a good chance of winning because mm-hmm. that's really what's been helping them the last – especially the last two ball games. because if you have a team trying to sell out and stop the run, he's just going to hit you downfield, play action, hit, do some RPOs, stuff like that. And um, they've been really successful in doing that. Perfect. Awesome. Well, great stuff, Jeremy. For folks that are looking to get more, uh, Jeremy and I have a, a VIP preview up on Thursday morning, both of us answering some more in-depth questions, more kind of analysis analysis style of stuff. We also have a VIP sale going on at Fog.net. You can get VIP through the end of football season for just $1. Um, and as always, Jeremy, make sure everyone is checking your stuff out. Where can they find you on Twitter and all the various social platforms? Well, the site's hornfrogblitz.com, and my Twitter is at jclarkhfb247. It's a long one, so just uh, rewind and listen again. Perfect. We love it. Well, thanks a bunch, Jeremy, for coming on. Great stuff. Appreciate you, man.